morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today's uh, responsive scripture reading today is from Isaiah, Hosea, chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. Nonetheless, those who are in distress won't be exhausted. And at an earlier time, God cursed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but later he glorified the way of the sea, the far side of the Jordan, and the Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in a pitch dark land, light has dawned. You might have made the nation great. You, ate, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as those who divide plunder rejoice. As on the day of Midian, you shattered the yoke that burdened them the staff on their shoulders, and the rod of their oppressor. That ends our reading. This morning's scripture follows Isaiah's prophecy to King Ahab. In chapter 7 and chapter 8 are broken down and they're bleak and they're dark predictions of the destruction of Jerusalem by neighboring kings hostile to the house of David. And it introduces perhaps the most well-known biblical text in Isaiah. Verse 6 is George Frederick Handel's verse inspiration, really, in his masterpiece in the Messiah, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And no, I've not gone off the rails. I know we are entering Lent, not Advent. But it is the last day of Epiphany And today we're focusing on the transfiguration of Jesus, Jesus among us. You remember the transfiguration, don't you? The transfiguration is when Jesus goes to the top of a high mountain and takes Peter and James and John with him. And according to Matthew 17, 2, while he's there, Jesus was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. So unlike the earlier chapters, chapter 19 is filled with hopeful promises. It's it's welcome news for Israel because it promises liberation. It's a statement of hope. That hope is rooted in the person of the child referred to in verse verse six. Now the lands of Zebulun and Naphtali were vulnerable states. They laid between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And that vulnerability, living between the two and and having to live between the two, meant that any time they could have a war on their property, on their territory, as the northerners moved south and the southerners moved north. And they were both weak states. In these conquered territories, as in any conquered territory, frequently the brutality leads, and for them it led to severe poverty and hunger and created a deep darkness that robbed the inhabitants of their hope. Conquered people are subject to the whims and the demands of their conquerors and lack any real power. They have no security or safety. 
All their assets will be taken, can be taken by the invaders. Parents could lose every child as the children are enslaved and carried off. The overseers of any occupied territory can take the entire harvest from the fields worked for by the local residents. Inhabitants of conquered territory lose their future hope. It's stolen by the conquerors who have the final word. It sounds bleak, doesn't it? But hope is restored not by a new invading army, but by a child on whose shoulders a new government will rest. Right now, people in our world need that kind of hope. Instead, we live with daily news about the suffering of our brothers and sisters in the UK, Ukraine. They're fighting Russia's attempt to take over their territory by force. And according to Wikipedia, between February 24 last year and February 4 this year, 9,000 soldiers and 42,200 civilians were killed and another 11,700 were wounded in the Ukraine alone. To put some perspective here, think about wiping out the entire town of State College, Pennsylvania, which in 2020 had a population of 40,501. But Ukraine isn't the only country at war or experiencing civil disobedience. The people of the Democratic Republic of the Congo Somalia, Southern Sudan, Syria, Ecuador, El Salvador, and countries with gangs who have wars with each other all live in fear. And in the United States, in just six weeks of 2023, there have been 71 mass shootings, according to USA Today. It's bleak. According to Isaiah in chapters 1 through 8, where he talks about the invasion and the occupation, Naphtali and Zebulon were brought into this terrible situation by their sin. The passage brings to mind the great victory under Gideon. Remember Gideon? Let's refresh our memories because most of us don't. So let's take a quick look at Judges 6. Now, you might want to take your Bibles out, or the, one of the pew Bibles, and open them to Judges 6. And when you get home, you can read the whole thing. Let's turn to Judges chapter 6, and we're going to focus as a background on verses 1 through 10. So just take a moment and review that. Because it describes the evil that God saw. One of the things it says is that in order to maintain a stash of food, the folks would put it in crevices and in and caves, lest it be confiscated by the Midianites, who occupied the land for seven years. The Midianites treated the Israelites terribly. It was a dark time. Then in verse 11, the liberation begins. During the night, Gideon becomes a humble servant. He's a farmer, by the way. But he becomes a humble servant who turns the religious world upside down with his attack on the altars of the idols dedicated to Baal. Ultimately, the Midianites are driven out of the land under a miracle described in chapter 7. Now, here's the thing. Israel, in those days, did not have an army. They didn't have an army. You'd put a call out to the people and folks would assemble. But they were not trained. They were not a trained army. 
But God gives Gideon a plan. And Gideon used only 300 men to secure the liberation of Israel. Now there's an interesting connection between this successful military operation and Isaiah 9. The weapon that won this battle with Gideon was light. Light. And it was won when 300 civilian soldiers surrounded the enemy camp, hiding a torch in each of the 300 jugs that they were told to, to carry. And with it, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the other Easterners made up that enemy camp. There were so many in the entire camp that, according to verse 12, they were spread across the valley like a swarm of locusts. Their camels were too many to count, like grains of sand on the seashore. Can you get that picture in your head? Big army. 300 Israelites. And God gives Gideon a plan. So at the appointed hour, in the middle of the night, the 300 chosen Israelites surround the enemy camp. Their volunteer army took, each of them took a trumpet, an empty jar, and a lighted torch, which they put inside of the jar. At Gideon's command, the soldiers blew their trumpets and smashed their jars at Gideon's command, according to verse 19. The enemy fled in fear while the Israelites from Naphtali and all of Manasseh chased after the Midianites. The Israelites won the battle. But what are the odds that so few could make such a significant difference? What made the difference? The dependent on God's, dependence on God's direction and willingness to do what was necessary to drive the invaders from the land of these folks who lived in deep darkness. And here's the most remarkable thing. They did it with light. Light. Isaiah 9, chapter 6 predicts the future of light, salvation, and hope for the darkness described in the previous verses of this prophecy. So the Son of God comes to us, each of us, just as light saved Zebulon and Naphtali. That's God's promise to us. It's predicted here. Verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in pitch dark land, a pitch dark land, the light has dawned. And though the people who originally received this prophecy waited centuries for that child, we know Jesus is the fulfillment. We know people living in darkness in our world. There are people in our midst who have no sunshine in their lives. Just Thursday we heard that one of our elected officials checked himself into a hospital psych psychiatric center. Now whether you voted for him or not, whether you like him or not, he stands out as a courageous example for people who struggle with depression and consider treatment for their depression, but choose to hide it or even end their own lives. People frequently live with a sense of denial that leads to isolation from resources that help them cope. One of my colleagues, I'm sorry, one of my colleagues years ago shared a story from her experience when she started at a new church. She was pastoring that new church and a parishioner asked her to visit his mother in the hospital. Now, his mother had terminal cancer. She was, then they didn't call it this, but she was probably on hospice, that's why she was there. She was also a nurse. She wasn't a church member. But a visit and a prayer would be helpful. So the pastor visited, and during her visit, 
Because she knew mom was terminal, she prayed a prayer of hope that recognized that even when there seems to be no hope, God is still present. The next day, she received a call from the hospital chaplain who shared that the family asked him, or asked her, I'm sorry, not to visit mom again. It seems she was furious after the visit because she thought the pastor said her situation was hopeless. Or consider Henry, who could not get over his anger because his only child, his daughter, had alerted his doctor of the hazard that Henry had become as a driver. By the way, I think that's most of all of our nightmare. When somebody tells the doctor on us, we're a danger. Yeah, that's another story. But for Henry, the consequences meant that the doctor took Henry's license, uh, suspended, reported Henry so his license was suspended. Even though his only surviving relative, that is, in his family, was his only child. Henry's unresolved anger destroyed their relationship. And after his license was suspended, the daughter never heard her father speak to her again, even though she was with him the moment he passed to eternity. Both people lived and died in darkness because they refused to recognize the light available to them. And these are just a few of the folks who live in darkness. Other people with unresolved grief are held captive in the darkness because they cannot celebrate old memories. So those memories haunt them with a longing for a different present and future. Grudges also keep people, from, uh, tra keep people trapped in anger and isolation that brings their own darkness. Now here's the good news. It doesn't have to be that way. Isaiah 9 becomes a source of hope for all of us. It's a promise. Hear it again. As on the day of Midian, you've shattered the yoke that burdened them, the staff on their shoulders and the rod of their oppressor. Because every boot of the thundering warriors and every garment rolled in blood will be burned fuel for the fire. And here it is. A child is born to us. A son is given to us. And authority will be on his shoulders. He's, he, he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There were difficult times ahead for Israel and for the Israelites. And it still goes on. Unfortunately, our lack of actual history, teaching history in our school curriculums or history at all, means we're deemed to repeat history. The rise of white supremacy, anti-Semitism, and racial discrimination in our country is aided by the lack of corporate memory of the atrocities of World War II and the more than 17,883,000 people exterminated by the Nazis. We keep talking about the 7 million Jews, but there are 10 million others. And don't be deceived. Genocide continues in authoritarian-led countries. At this moment, Russia is targeting civilians to gain territory in Ukraine. And wars, dictators, racism, sexism, and other kinds of prejudice threaten to terminate people even as I am talking about this darkness. Ignoring the darkness won't produce light. <coughs> Hate and vengeance 
Don't create solid communities or churches. But we have an answer. In chapter one of his gospel, John clearly knows who Jesus is. He's not merely a man. The other gospels present Jesus with an emphasis on his humanity, miracles, and journeys. But John gets behind those attributes, while Matthew and Luke both proclaim that Jesus had an unusual and miraculous birth and life, John clearly knows who Jesus is. Jesus is a part of the unity of the Trinity. Jesus is God. Listen to John's words. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word. And without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the Word was life. And the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. Clearly, John equates Jesus, God in human form, as the child referred to in Isaiah 9. John the Baptist was a man sent by God to point to the light. It's Jesus who brings light to life. Jesus displays all the characteristics of someone more than a man when he heals, sees the future, defies nature as he walks on water, calms a terrifying storm on the Sea of Galilee, and was raised from the dead and raised the dead. The verses of Isaiah 9 offer comfort and insight to us, even today, when we feel alone, when life seems dark, when we begin to believe that we're at, we actually have it more difficult than Job. In the middle of the night, when no one else is around and loneliness overcomes us, it's then that we need and have the reassurance that God is with us. That's the meaning of Emmanuel. God is with us. Isn't that reassuring? As Christ followers, we have an assurance that we are not alone. Though we may lose our job, our bank accounts, or loved ones, God is with us. Though we may despair, feel lonely, or face a bleak future, the good news is that God is there even when we don't realize it. You may turn your back on God. You may be angry with God. God's still standing right there by you. He may carry you sometimes. Remember, Gideon used only 300 farmers to defeat the amassed armies of Midians, Midianites, Amalekites, and Bedouins from the east. Against incredible odds. Let me see if that's me. Let me find it. You think it's here? I don't know. Let's try it again. I'll cut that out. Against incredible odds, Gideon and his army won. And you can too. God's with you. God will help you cope with all the tension and difficult situations you face at every stage of your life. The conditions may differ, but God's there to help you navigate through them triumphantly. Now if you are fully, now if you are fearful, and doubt yourself. 
face challenging situations, have anxiety about the future, have a demanding boss, or have a complicated past, Jesus is here to help. All you need to do is accept that help. If you haven't accepted Jesus into your life, we want to invite you to take that step today. You can come to God's throne or you can see me after the service. We'll pray with you. We'll help you. We'll help you navigate through life with God at your side. Remember his name, wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. He has vast authority and brings endless peace to his throne and kingdom. In him is justice and righteousness has been established and sustained right now and will be for eternity. Remember the prophecy, but more, his name.